Welcome to the Speaking Podcast. You can find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. We're also on BitChute and YouTube. You'll find the links in the podcast description. I'm also a podcasting coach because I've got four other podcasts. Before getting to the top half percent, and you'll find everything on bio.link forward slash podcaster. Today, my guest is a public speaker, is a LinkedIn strategist, a coach. Please welcome Limor Bergman Gross. Did I do it justice? Yes. Hi, Roy. <laughs> Great Hi. to be here today. Hey, you're very welcome. So you might let the listeners know a bit more about him. Who are you? Yeah. So who am I? So I'm Limor. I'm based in Israel. Got back here three years ago after spending nine years in the U.S. And my professional background is tech. I used to work in the tech industry for over 20 years. I used to be a software engineer and then grew into leadership positions. And along the way, I found passion to help women, help women grow in the tech industry. And uh, when I got back here three years ago, I decided to change course in my career and start my own business. And that's where I started coaching, mainly coaching. That's what I do most of the time. And supporting other women in the tech industry and help them grow into leadership positions and uh, excel in their jobs. Okay, excellent. So did you study in Israel and then move to work in America or how did the trip to the US? Uh, so I started in Israel and I worked in Israel. And then what happened was that my husband was offered to move to Denver, Colorado. It was uh, 13 years ago. Uh, yeah, 13 years ago. And uh, and so for some reason, you know, we felt adventurous and uh, we moved with four very young children. I had twins that were babies at the time and uh, for some reason it made sense I don't know to move countries and uh, that's how we kind of moved to the U.S. and we didn't think how long we'll stay there but eventually we stayed there for nine years and when my oldest was a high schooler we decided to go back otherwise um, basically she will continue her life in the U.S. and we preferred just to go back and then we'll see how their lives will evolve. And has it been hard to transition when you came back for the other children? It's not easy coming back. And my kids grew up as Americans. I mean, most of their life spent in the U.S. And uh, coming back here was hard. Culture difference, you know, language. Although we speak Hebrew at home, still their Hebrew is not as good as their English. So, um it's not easy. It's not easy coming back. But on the other hand, it's a, I think it's good experience for them because also in the U.S. we lived in multiple places and they moved quite a bit. I think it helps them become more open-minded and uh, more resilient. No, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So with, um, like, I, I know you talk a lot on kind of like mentor, mentee, but you might kind of let people know the kind of the reason why it's so beneficial. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I asked, I started, uh, you know, I had my first mentor when I started becoming a manager for the first time. And uh, I really needed someone to help me. I had no clue what I was doing. And I started mentoring myself in the beginning of 2017. And, uh, and I found out it's so beneficial it's so beneficial for people to have someone that uh, has experience in a specific area and can help, can help from their experience, can help provide guidance, sometimes just be a sounding board. Sometimes that's all it takes. And mentorship is so important for multiple reasons. It's confidence building, it's support, it's helping someone see a broader picture than they might otherwise have seen. Uh, opening their eyes to possibilities and just giving them sometimes some directions they haven't thought about. So it's helping someone progress in their careers just with having someone to hold their hand and, and support them rather than do it all by themselves. And like I know that you were like a software engineer before you became a kind of manager. Yeah. And a lot of the time, people, they throw people into the positions without kind of giving them the proper training and everything. The reality is if they kind of designate a mentor before they give you the position, 
that would be a better transition for somebody because sometimes, unfortunately, people, one, they don't want it, and two, it's not suitable for them, and they end up le leaving the organization when they could have been, you know, fantastic at their job originally. Yes, absolutely, yeah, because what happens is that you, uh, either you start a new job or you start a new role or maybe you moved within the company, and a lot of times you don't, you don't know a lot of things. And sometimes people in your surrounding can help you. It depends how people are willing to help and how much you feel comfortable asking for help. And many times, especially for women, we feel uncomfortable because we are afraid that if we ask for help or if we acknowledge that we don't know something, it will be seen as a weakness. It will be seen as, oh, you're not good enough. Maybe you cannot do this job. And with a mentor, you don't have those thoughts. You just, okay, uh, you feel more comfortable asking someone that is a mentor. You don't feel like they're going to judge you. No, no, absolutely. There's two kind of different things that can happen in the mentor-mentee situation. One is the mentee, because it's happened me with, say, the public. I mean, not all through, the, I've had a lot of different uh, businesses and I've always kind of uh -huh. helped people up. But say in the public speaking side of the sea, a lot of times people would come out and they'd ask for your help. I've had a load of people that had asked me to be their mentor. But basically, they did nothing then when I was giving them the advice. So you've got that, the bad mentee. But also, mm. I know there's some mentors as well that maybe have a bad ego. They're just not the right type. Their personality clashes. So you might touch on both of them. Yeah, so first of all, uh, as a, if you ask for someone to help you, you need to be open to get the help, right? I mean, the situations that you mentioned that someone approach you and you try to help them, but they basically ignore, do nothing with what you share, then I don't know what are the reasons. Maybe they're afraid. Maybe they prefer not, you know, they, they may choose a different route. That's theirs. Uh, so they need to be open-minded and, and really willing to do something. Uh, a lot of times it's fear. It's, not, you know, not wanting to get out of their comfort zone. Now about the match between a mentor and mentee, a lot of times it happens that people just don't feel comfortable with each other. They don't trust each other. Maybe there's a personality chain, you know, difference. And uh, maybe some values are different from the mentor and mentee and they just don't, don't fit together and that's okay. So they shouldn't continue meeting and they should find someone else to help them. And it's sometimes it's the same that people prefer the same sex to be their mentor. And especially in your sector, because unfortunately it seems to be male. It, yes. The majority is male. And it, like, I think even in different positions, unfortunately, I don't know, do they feel threatened or what, but you can see sometimes that a woman might have way more talent, but they keep them down. They don't want them to take say the director role or the manager position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes women feel more comfortable with a woman mentor because they feel they can be vulnerable. They can share challenges that they have that maybe another woman can relate to. They f they feel like they will not be judged. They feel just more comfortable talking with another woman. I have seen also situations where someone wanted to speak not just with a woman, but for example, a woman from a certain background, woman of color or a woman from a specific country. So it could be even more specific than that. Depending on the person, obviously. Yeah. What's your thoughts on somebody having multi... Like, it's different when they're from different organizations, but maybe having two or three mentors in the same organization. Have you seen that happen? You mean internal mentoring? That mentors... Yeah. Mentoring... Yeah. Yeah, like yes, for somebody... Yes, yes, definitely. Definitely. That can... That can... Uh, that is very good to have that. The only challenge I would say with internal mentoring is that you want to make sure that... Uh, the mentee feels comfortable sharing and uh, it can happen that if the mentor and mentee work in sim similar team, department, if they know the same people, that there may be some challenges for the mentee to share certain things, right? I mean, uh, let's say they don't get along with a coworker or they have some challenges with their manager. And if the mentor knows those people or maybe even work with them, they may not feel comfortable talking about it. So I think it's very effective, but it's better that the mentor and mentee don't work together and don't work with the same people within an organization. Excellent. 
So I know you talk about kind of personal branding as well. And I know you, you yeah. LinkedIn, obviously you're a specialist in, in the LinkedIn. So you might kind of touch a bit on that. Yeah, it all started when I moved to the US. So I had to find my my first job. I didn't know anyone. And, the, and I started applying to jobs and it was not fruitful. No one reached out to me. No one responded basically because it's all like, I don't know, automatic scanners and all that. And I started working on my LinkedIn profile and uh, found my first job. And after that, jobs just found me. I just started being approached by recruiters. And uh, it's super important to build your profile and to focus on what you want to have rather than what you have right now. I just had a conversation with a coach yesterday and her LinkedIn profile reflected what she does today, but she wanted to do something slightly different. So I told her, okay, you have to make sure that when someone lands on your profile, they can see that you're a fit to the next role you want to do, not to the current one. And and also the branding is not just what you write on your profile, it's also what you do on social media. It's so important to engage, even if you're relatively passive and you're just commenting out, sharing posts, but you have to be engaged. People like to connect with people and people that will consider you as an employee, we want to know a little bit more about you. And that's why they go to social media. And based on what you share on social media, they may get some, you know, some insights about who you are and how you can fit to the organization. I think it can kind of come back to bite you as well, because I've seen you it know, can, sometimes people, you... you know, they could be like the party animal and they'd post not the best of pictures on, say, their Facebook but. The employers are checking everything. They're yes, checking definitely. their Instagram. They're checking the whole lot. Their Twitter, even to see are they kind of aggressive or are they actually, you know, polite and how they engage with other people. Because you can see everything if you go into their profiles. Yes, that's that's true. That's true. But LinkedIn is a professional network, so you should be. I'm not saying that you shouldn't expose who you are, but you should be professional. It's not a place to put anything partying or stuff like that it's it's just not the right place and as you said maybe it's better to be careful altogether on what you put on social media because that may affect your future chances of getting a job absolutely and which like i mean you're you're doing a few things do you think for the branding like to have everything in the one place and they see you or do you prefer that what do you recommend that people kind of keep you know, the coaching here, speaking here, or whatever different people, because a I lot of people have a lot of hats on. It depends. It depends what fits you most and how much time you have and where your audience is at. That's very important. I mean, maybe your audience is not on LinkedIn and it's someplace else. So you should invest in another place. I, I don't have like one concrete answer. Uh, I think on LinkedIn, you can basically wear different hats you can share different talents because we are multi-talented all of us no one is just capable of doing one thing so i don't see a reason why you can't share different things that you're doing like you know for me public speaking and and coaching and mentoring and uh, running workshops and you know i don't have to just show one aspect of my professional life but if i want to share something about i don't know running well, maybe I can share that on LinkedIn, but maybe I want to share it on Instagram, for example, because that's where I share more personal stuff. So it really depends. With uh, like the last, I suppose, three years, there's a lot more people that are working remotely. And I suppose uh, like trying to build your team. So if you're the manager or the director of the company, when they're remote, what's your kind of advice? Because it's, it's a hairy. I think it's brilliant in some senses because, you know, people aren't spending two or three hours in a car, especially in America. This, you know, But it seems to be like that in a lot of places now. But the other thing is like how to make sure they're actually working and that you're able to connect other people because there's a, a kind of social bond as well that happens in an office that helps people get more creative and kind of look out for each other. Whereas when they're at home, everything changes. So I'm just curious what you're kind of... Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, remote brings a lot of good things and a lot of challenges. Remote work is here to stay. <laughs> I mean, it's not going to change, right? I mean, yes, people are going to come to offices, but people are also going to work from home. A lot of companies are doing hybrid 
some do fully remote, some try to do more office. So I think being flexible is key to allow people to work where they feel most productive and where it fits their lifestyle because many people will need to be at home because they need to take care of parents or kids or what have you. They have their own personal circumstances that they need to be able to work from home. But there need to be a lot of uh, some level of trust because if you don't trust the people that work for you, that's going to be difficult, right? If you feel like, and I had managers like that, they said, you have to be in the office because you have to watch what people are doing. And that's not how I believe a manager should manage. You need to trust and you need to see what are their motivations. Why are they doing the job that they're doing? What do they like? What do they enjoy? Uh, you need to motivate them by making sure that they understand what's their growth path at your company. You need to support them. You need to give them guidance, trainings, mentors. So, because when people feel that they are doing something interesting, that they are evolving, they are growing, there is a path for them forward in the organization, they will do their work. You don't need to supervise them very closely. Mm-hmm. And about the, you know, the dynamic between the team members, there are multiple ways to do that. Obviously, you can arrange personal meetings if and when possible, you know, I was doing a lot of offsites, you know, we're doing like, okay, let's meet in a few days. It's expensive, right? You need to fly, sometimes fly people over accommodations and all that, but it's great to allow people to connect. And if not, you can do things virtually. You can do hackathons. You can do lunch and learns where people share different things. You can just allow them to casually meet for like kind of, a, I don't know, a, some uh, afternoons towards the weekend, maybe they do like everyone brings their favorite drink and they just do a happy hour. So you can find opportunities even virtually to allow the employees to connect on a more personal level, not work related. Excellent. Excellent. And I know you touch about uh, presentation skills and kind of true kind of storytelling. So you might kind of let people know about it because uh, I mean, the majority of speakers are actually doing some form of presentation at some sort stage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so pre- presentation is obviously very, very important for everyone and not just for business uh, owners, right? Also for employees because it's not enough that you do the job. You also need to showcase what you do. And many times you need to just share what you're doing either in a very intimate setting, in front of your manager, in front of peers, in front of maybe a larger audience, it's super, super important. My first public speaking experience was in a conference and it was dreadful. I mean, I was scared and I was probably not that good. And I realized along the years that I have to sharpen those skills. I have to become a better speaker. And it's all about thinking about the audience, what is interesting and relevant for them rather than what do you want to talk about? And you, most people, they are more self-centered about what they want to talk about. And that's where the audience is just, they're losing the audience because they don't care. If you talk to an audience, for example, that is not very technical and you share a lot of acronyms and you talk about, you know, things that you love and passionate, software engineers have that tendency, right? To talk all day long about what they do. It may not be interesting for the audience and you may lose them. Public speaking is, you know, I can talk about it for hours. It's I run workshops on that. It's a whole thing. But but kind of to distill that, think about the audience and build a story. People connect to stories. People love hearing stories. So when you present something, it, it all has to flow. There has to be some kind of flow, some logic, and share some interesting kind of anecdotes, some stories to keep people engaged and listen to you. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. And with the, say, workshops, because I know a lot of people doing workshops. What have you kind of learned over the years? Because, you know, one, if it's in a corporation, if they kind of make people go to the workshop, which happens. <laughs> and just two, the different things that you've kind of learned, obviously the storytelling as well in workshops, but what you've kind of, you you wish you could go back and tell your younger self when you were doing the first few workshops. Yeah, I think that... Uh... I would definitely uh, say to my younger self that it has to be a story. Again, sometimes the story is not like it's not a fairy tale. It it is very like technical, right? 
can be on a very technical matter, but it has to be something that has a flow and logic. The slide should be minimal, not too much text. It's not about reading what the slide, and I was terrible. I was just writing a bunch and bunch of text in the slide. Write less, put more graphics, and also try to kind of uh, do different things, diversify your presentation, put a video and maybe an image and maybe a graph, just constantly, you know, uh, diversify. And also engage with the audience. It's very difficult to keep people engage when you just stand there and talk and there is no conversation. So try to engage with polls, with questions, you know, whatever you can do to get some feedback, to get people to share something, to answer something, to do something, not just listen. Excellent. And with the coaching, you're, you're basically helping women in the tech world, basically. Yes. Kind of, and just like, because obviously, you know, there's a lot of women listeners as well. What, what kind of advice would you kind of give, give people that are kind of, I suppose, say even a software engineer, they're kind of in a man's world as such. Uh, I think that uh, the advice is to find someone who can help them if they need help, uh, connect with like-minded individuals, find communities that you can get support, right? I mean, if you're a woman in a tech world, very male dominant, find there are a lot of communities, both physical and virtual communities for women in tech, Find like-minded people, find mentors and coaches that can help you and support you and give you the confidence you need and help you when you are not sure what you need to do in order to advance your career. I wish I had more mentors and coaches along my career. I think probably I could have advanced my career sooner and faster than I did because I was, you know, trying to navigate things the way I thought I should. No one really, in many, many years, no one really told me or helped me. Excellent. I know you talk as well about um, like an introvert networking. So because yeah. I mean, sometimes I, I actually I believe a lot of speakers are actually introverts, even though they come across as extra extroverts, because I've met a lot of them and you, you would actually think they'd be the life of the party, but they prefer to be to themselves. But like for the networking, especially because I mean, sometimes like the corporations are sending people and they need to, yeah. you know, try to generate a bit of business or make the contact. So what's your kind of advice and yeah, uh, I'm. I consider myself an introvert. I, uh, I'm. I'm usually intimidated from large conference. I, I always, you know, I always was, and I was going to many conferences with thousands and thousands of participants, and I was dreaded. You know, I, I was usually just dreadful and really wanted just to go back to my hotel room and just not, not see anyone and talk to anyone. It definitely doesn't come naturally to me. I think today with a lot of virtual meetups and conferences, it's it's a little bit less intimidating, it's li- at least for me as an introvert, to network when you're sitting in your comfort of your home and, and meet other people. And you can do also one-on-one kind of networking things. Like, for example, there's one platform that they used to use called Lunch Club, basically that they match you up with one or more people every week. And it's just a one-on-one. So it's easier for people who are less comfortable. But I also recommend people to stretch themselves a little bit. Just for example, today, tonight, I'm going to some kind of local uh, tech conference. Uh, And I'm going because I know that I have to network. And not again, not always I'm super excited about it. Say, oh, okay, I'm going to, and I know it's an event. I will have to start talking with people that I don't know. But sometimes you have to kind of train the muscle In order to, I'm not saying that I will change who I am and I will become a completely different person, but sometimes yes, training those muscles that maybe you feel less comfortable naturally doing helps. Excellent. And with a lot of the companies that I had, I used to create uh, like the metal pin and or even the PMP pin that people then come up to you and they're like, Mm. what's that about? And it's just... But also, it's like you can just if you see someone with a pin, just saying, "Curious, I like the pin," and just and it's yeah. small little cool. things like that 
that actually just and you'll find that the majority of people they actually they're delighted to somebody to actually engage in a conversation absolutely you know, yeah. i i think there's a high percentage of people i mean obviously there's a lot of it that there is a i i don't know what the percentage is but it ain't that high the real extroverts they'll just go around and they'll but most yeah. people you if you look around if you're paying attention because i'm always kind of conscious of in you know if i'm going to and i see somebody that they're you know that they're struggling that you try to bring them in in a conversation i think majority of people actually they love that you've just actually engaged in a conversation. Whereas, so what's the worst that can happen? Nobody's ever said, you know, sorry, I'm not interested or whatever, because yeah. it's never happened. And that's the thing. It's like, I think we have to kind of make a list of what's the worst that can happen if I actually just start talking to somebody. It's Yes. And people usually come to the, the, those events to network. So they all have similar motivations. No, exactly. And just finally, because I know you talk about kind of confidence building as well, because it's kind of, I suppose they're connected with that, but also in in business when you're actually working as an employee for somebody. So you might just kind of touch a little on that as well. Yeah, I think uh, the confidence building is something that depending on who you are and what you need, there are a lot of ways to do it. First of all, I think getting getting help is always good, right? Getting mentors and coaches to support you surrounding yourself with people that uh, bring you up, that lift you up. It's very, very important because a lot of times we have friends, you know, we have those energy drainers, you know, the ones that are always complaining that they're negative. And those people really hurt us a lot of times unintentionally because they just, they just bring us down with them. So try to find the people that actually makes you feel better, that helps you, that supports you that always have good energy or try to meet new people that are like-minded. It's so, always and I, helpful. And I think some people believe that if somebody was their friend for life or, or group of friends, that it should stay that way. And when you realize somebody's not serving you, because there is a lot of negativity out there, but the way I see it is when I see people and you feel better coming away from their house or their conversation, they're the people that surround yourself rather than realizing they've just sucked half the energy out of my body. <laughs> yes. And you know, it's not that I'm trying to say disconnect with any, anyone like that completely, but maybe reduce, reduce the interactions and find other interactions that are supporting you, that are bringing you the energy that you need. Absolutely. Isn't thoroughly enjoyed our conversation? You yeah, might let me people too. know how they can get in contact with you. Definitely. I think the best way is LinkedIn. Just type Limor Bergman, look me up and connect with me. I think that's the best way. I have also a website, limorbergman.com, but I prefer usually people coming to LinkedIn and getting to know me a little bit. No, excellent. Yeah, perfect. And I'll make sure I'll put the LinkedIn as well yeah. as the website on Thank both you. the audio and the video. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Roy. So that's all for the Speaking Podcast. As mentioned, you'll find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com or on BitChute and YouTube. Find the links to the podcast description and all my other podcasts as well as the coaching can be found on bio.link forward slash podcaster. Sure to give us a thumbs up, five star rating. Really helps. Until next week, take care.